what many of you might not know is I was the very first faculty member um, hired into computational medicine and bioinformatics. So I was here 14 years ago before we were a department. So it's been great. It's been great seeing the department form and grow over the years and to be part of that. So um, I decided today to talk about one of a few lines of research my lab has worked on over the past decade or so, that is precision medicine for head and neck cancer. Uh, and mainly we've been focusing on uh, biomarker discovery for this. And so over this research, we've performed uh, analysis on numerous types of omics data. Uh, as well as using both unsupervised and supervised machine learning techniques. But one thing we have not used is deep learning, and that's the title of the talk. And so I wanted to start off by putting this research kind of into a broader perspective. Um, so I've been, I realized the other day, I've been in the field of bioinformatics for over 20 years now. And at some point during that time, I realized that bioinformatics trends really tends to come in waves. Um, with each wave being started by the invention of some new technology. And so if we look at the timeline of bioinformatics, uh, the first wave I see is starting in around 2000, and this was microarrays. So finally, for the first time, we were able to see things on a high throughput scale, and it was really amazing. And I was lucky to be an early graduate student during this time, and so I jumped on this wave and wrote it far, and I got a lot of uh, good publications out of it. So then jump forward to 2008 um, for when the next wave started. And I bet many of you could guess what this is. This was the introduction of next generation sequencing and when that started. So this in a few short years led to the explosion of many types of omics data. This was when I started to study head and neck cancer. And so I was also able to ride this wave fairly far, both in terms of developing methods to analyze this kinds of data uh, and also um, applying this data to study head and neck cancers and uh, really try to understand heterogeneity of cancers in ways that people hadn't been able to use before. So the last two waves I'll mention came fairly close in time together. So 2016, probably many people could guess that one as well. That's the introduction of single cell technologies. And then in 2018, this one, you may argue with the, the uh, exact year because I think it ramped up a little bit more slowly, but this is deep learning. So this is a, you know, a really hot field, especially with our students right now. And so deep learning was really supposed to kind of save us from the arduous task of feature extraction, right? But not in all cases. So I've been studying a disease for over a decade now, and uh, I really don't think that the questions we've been trying to ask could um, either could be, um, found by deep, deep learning, at least with the data we have right now, or it's not the most appropriate thing. Now, don't get me wrong. I think deep learning is awesome. It's totally revolutionized several fields of research. And like previous waves, it's allowed people to answer questions that they haven't been able to before. Uh, I'm just saying it's not a be all end all, right? And so this slide is meant for the, the students mainly in the room. So deep learning, you know, in the end, it's just one of many tools that we should be keeping in our so-called bioinformatics toolbox. And so if, if you students want to be an outstanding bioinformatician, then um, you'll want to know much more than just deep learning so that you can, you know, really focus on helping understand a, um, a, a you know, an important biological problem or disease using whatever tools are most appropriate for the task. So now getting back to, to my research. So I've been studying head, neck, head and neck cancer, which is the sixth most common cancer worldwide with over 800,000 cases per year. And it has about a 50% five-year survival rate. Um, you might think, okay, the other 50% of patients who survive have you know, a, a great rest of their life, but that's not the case because the treatment can have horrible lifelong um, side effects, unfortunately. And so here are some of those side effects. Um, patients can have a permanent loss of saliva. You know, you can't eat without saliva. Um, PES is when uh, is the inability to eat either because you, you can't swallow or because the tube has narrowed so much that sometimes even saliva needs to be um, taken out. Um, patients can have inability to speak. So clearly these things have a huge impact on their quality of life. Uh, and even the worst quality of life issues come when the tumor recurs, in which case patients can have real severe facial malformations. 
And so the type of um, head and neck cancer I've mainly been researching are those associated with human papillomavirus or HPV. Uh, and this usually tends to occur in the oropharynx cancer cases. Uh, and at University of Michigan, at least about 90% of these now are associated with HPV. So this is a, a small double-stranded DNA virus, has two main oncogenes I wanna point out, E6 and E7, which play big roles in the carcinogenic process. Of course, most people with HPV infections do not ever end up getting cancer. Um, E6 will come up later in, in my slide, so I wanna point that out. So most people are familiar with HPV being associated with cervical cancer. But what many people don't know is that where a cervical cancer in the US has been gradually trending down, well, pharynx cancer cases have been uh, increasing very rapidly so that there's way more oral pharynx cancer um, cases related to HPV now than there are cervical cancer cases. So the first years of my research in head and neck, head and neck cancer was mainly focused on differences between HPV positive and negative patients. So we learned a lot about differences in tumor biology. And the one I wanted to point out here is that uh, HPV positive patients have quite a bit better prognosis, and that's because their tumors tend to respond better to treatment. And so if you look um, down on the right here, you see two um, survival curves for disease-free and overall survival. And you see that the HPV positive patients have a significantly better prognosis than HPV negative. So about 80% of them live, but they still have these horrible side effects from treatment sometimes. And so um, something that my lab and others are working on now is can we identify a subset of HPV positive cancer patients who can benefit from de-escalated treatment? And also conversely, can we identify a, a subset of the highest risk patients who could benefit from an additional therapy? Uh, so really our goal is to try to realize the potential for precision medicine. But the key is, you know, which HPV positive patients? So uh, unfortunately, so far, the, the, the de-escalation trials have not been successful. They've used fairly basic information such as tumor stage, smoking status, and have either resulted in worse survival outcomes, and so the trial needed to be stopped early, or they haven't shown any improvement in quality of life. So clearly, I think we need to dive deeper into the molecular features. So I've thought a little bit, especially for this talk, about what it would take to use deep learning for feature extraction and prediction for this problem. So what do we have so far? So we have RNA-seq, CNAs, whole genome by sulfite sequencing, um, another omics approach for a different epigenomic mark, as well as a lot of clinical and demographic data. And so if we had sufficient sample size for this with appropriate metadata, like the treatment and outcome, then we could potentially use a supervised deep learning model to predict the risk of recurrence or survival and adjust the treatment for each patient accordingly. But what do we have? So we only have, or will be able to ever get, I think, a few hundred samples at best. For some of these data, we only have them for 36. And this is a really highly heterogeneous disease. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we have potentially millions of features. So this imbalance is exactly the, the type of problem where you need to rely heavily on biological or domain-specific knowledge to help you fill the gap. So the rest of my talk is gonna be on how we've done that um, in our research. So I'm gonna say you know, four uh, promising molecular features that we've picked out so far, but these are really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know, I limited it to four for this talk today. So the first one I'll mention is molecular tumor subtypes. So I mentioned this first because it was the first um, to be characterized and also the others are um, correlated with the subtypes. So my lab was the first to characterize these. Uh, we identified the IMU subtype, uh, which is named after its immune strong um, signature, and then KRT, which is named after being highly keratinized tumor type. And uh, the second one I'll talk about is HPV integration, which we uh, identified shortly after as being correlated with this. So normally HPV is an episomal or circular form and goes through its natural life cycle. But over the decades um, leading up to cancers, in some patients, HPV genes become integrated into the host genome, and this can lead to a number of downstream changes and you know, overall changes in the tumor properties. Third one I'll mention is, um, looks like a very small change. 
It's uh, changed from expressing the full length version of the E6 oncogene and HPV to a smaller spliced isoform called E6 star. So uh, this looks like a very small change and it would be difficult for a deep learning method to pick it up unless you knew about this isoform um, a priori, uh, but it has huge functional effects on changing what E6 does. And finally, I'll mention uh, DNA methylation, which is also correlated with the subtypes um, and specifically looking at uh, DNA methylation of transposable elements. So now going through these one by one. So the molecular subtypes, um, we characterize it in terms of gene expression, copy number variations, mutations, and, and so forth. And we see they're very clearly um, separate and easily detectable through, uh, through clustering. So we used very robust methods to identify this. So this is a case where deep learning would have been um, very much overkill because a simple unsupervised learning technique can handle it. And so these subtypes in the meta-analysis were seen to uh, have different prognosis with the immune strong subtype having better prognosis than the other KRT-like subtypes. Uh, for HPV integration, on the left, you see that the KRT subtype is significantly more likely to have an HPV integration event, both in the IMU cohort on the left and in the TCJ, the Cancer Genome Atlas cohort on the right. Um, and so this is a survival plot that we published showing that the IMU subtype in blue, sorry, not the IMU, integration negative patients in blue had significantly better survival than the integration positive patients in red as well as the HP negative in green. But it turns out that these results are somewhat mixed in the literature. And so our hypothesis right now is that these mixed results are due to the method that people used to identify HP integration. Different people use different methods. So using biological knowledge, we came up with a score, which we call the E-score, which tends to pull out a subset of the integration positive patients. And using a new cohort that we collected, we see that patients that have a low E-score have a significant lower survival rate. So we're gonna be following up on this in the future. The third one I'll mention is the E6 star activity, uh, which on the left you see we found to be correlated with the tumor size at diagnosis, uh, as well as some other features, including whether the patient is a smoker or not. And um, using some bioinformatic methods to estimate the E6 star activity, not just looking at its expression, we see that those patients that have higher E6 star activity in their tumors have significantly worse survival. And finally, I'll talk about DNA methylation. So DNA methylation is important to look at both because it's a very early um, event leading up to carcinogenesis. And so it, it can be used to try to kind of separate the carcinogenic pathways between different groups of, of tumors and patients. So on the left, you see that um, uh, DNA methylation in different families of transposable elements are different between the tumor subtypes with IMU in red and KRT in blue. And in the right, um, this work was done by a different group showing that um, in red uh, over here, that the HPV positive high methylation subtype has better survival than the HPV positive low methylation subtype. So all of this work together and, and other features that we've pulled out that I haven't gone through um, has led to you know, the uh, discovery of a lot of different relationships among both clinical and molecular features. And so this is a, a network graph that my student Bailey Garb just finished a few days ago. So we're gonna continue to work on this. So these are not genes. These are, each one of them is some molecular feature that we've extracted and pulled out. And uh, HPV subtype is in the middle in red. So in summary, you know, we've learned a lot about the tumor biology by relying heavily on domain specific knowledge. And not all of this at least I think could have been found by deep learning, especially with the small sample sizes that we have. So moving forward, we're, we hope to translate this to the clinic. I'm starting a new collaboration with a radiation oncologist here at Michigan, who's co-leading an HPV positive oral pharynx de-escalation clinical trial. And we hope to apply to add a, a molecular correlative study to the clinical trial to help prioritize uh, a few biomarkers for translation to a future clinical trial. And so now we're dealing with things that go into having a, uh, an ideal biomarker, such as uh, being reproducible, reproducible, easy to perform, and cost-effective, and so forth. And finally, I just want to acknowledge all of the people who uh, worked on this, 
both in my lab now, previous lab members, as well as my collaborators. Everyone in red here has worked to contribute towards this research. Thank you.